Let's dive a little deeper into the concepts of classes and objects in Ruby. So I'm looking at some working files here. You'll find them in the chapter three Ruby directory. I'm looking at class-person, class-person-constructor, and class-person-class-variables, all .rb files. We looked at the quadrilateral classes and some subclasses. We had some methods there, but one thing we didn't do was store any information to allow an individual object to contain some stateful identification, if you will, some attributes, some parameters. We're going to build on that now and see how one does that, because that's part and parcel of object-oriented design in Ruby and, of course, in Rails. So in class-person.rb, I have a class that I've written called person. It starts on line one, it ends on line nine. That's the definition of the class. It's got these on lines two, three, and four, adder accessor statements. What that's saying is that any object of class person, when I instantiate a new person, like on line 12, I say, let P be a new person, P equals person.new. What happens is that any object of class person, in this example, P, is going to have an F name attribute, an L name attribute, and an age attribute, corresponding, of course, to the first and last name and the age of the person that that object represents. I've also got a two string method. There on line six, I've defined two underscore s. That's kind of the canonical name. You'll see it again and again in Rails. We'll certainly use it later in this course. And on line seven, recall that methods in Ruby, in the absence of the actual keyword return, return what is last in the method. So on line seven, I'm returning a string. I'm doing some interpolation. We'll talk more about that. Suffice it to say that in this case, on line seven, the two underscore s method returns the first name, last name, and age of the person formatted as a string. The double quotes say, that's a string. The little pound sign in the curly braces say, well, return whatever the f name parameter is for this particular object. So these are instance attributes, storing information about the person. So on line 12, I say p equals person.new. Great, p is a new person. On lines 13, 14, and 15, I say, hey, let p.fname equal Brian and p.lname equals Hoke. Let's set this particular object, p, set its first name and last name. And on line 15, set p.age equals 44. On line 16, I put that to the screen. Print to the screen p. Well, in Ruby, as in Rails, if I define a two underscore s method, it's just as if I'm saying this, p.2 underscore s. But really, I can get away with some shorthanded to say, put to the screen P, and I've defined there on line six how I want it to be printed. Because, of course, a person is a structured object. Ruby'd have no way of knowing should I print the first name or the last name or the age. And then on lines 18 through 22, see that I can change those values. On line 19, I can set the F name of P to Pat. And on line 21, I can set the age of P to 43 and then print it again. So here I'll run that. And I'm just from a command line navigating to that directory and saying Ruby space class dash person dot RB. Ruby interpreter, please interpret the file I've just written. And you can see there it says Brian Hoke come age 44, Pat Hoke come age 33, representing the putting to the screen on line 16, changing some values and putting to the screen on line 22. What happens with those adder accessor statements is that really what I get is two methods in addition to an instance variable. So f name, l name, and age are all parameters, if you will. They're instance variables that allow me to store information for anything of class person. And the adder underscore accessor statement allows me to create both a setter method, where I can do something like on line 19, and a getter method where I can access that. I could put to the screen p.age or p.f name. Let's take a look at a more complicated example. This is class-person-constructor.rb. And here class person looks largely the same. I've got the adder accessor statement. So any object of class person still has an F name, an L name, and an age. But now I've added on line six a constructor. In Ruby, the initialize name for a method is reserved. In its particular, it means that's the constructor. Whenever class person is instantiated, whenever an object of class person is created, like happens on line 23 in this line, I can supply parameters 
whenever that creation of that object happens, do what's inside that initialize method. So on line seven, I'm saying, okay, if you're constructing a new person, I want the f name variable to be set to whatever the constructing calling code sets in that variable f. I want l name to be set to l and age to be set to a. So if we follow it on line 23, p equals person.new, Brian Hoke 44 is the three parameters. Brian gets substituted in for f, Hoke gets substituted in for l, and 44 for a. So it's a shorthand and it's a useful convenience to not have to do as we did back on class-person, those statements on lines 13, 14, and 15, where we set the individual fields. So on line 24, I could put that to the screen, and I would get Brian Hoke, age 44. I've also added another method here. It's a Boolean-valued method, that is, it returns true or false. And I've called it over underscore the underscore hill, question mark. And it returns false if the age of this person is less than 40. Otherwise, the last line in the method being true, it returns true. So in line 26, I can print to the screen the first name of P, which would be Brian in this case, is over the hill, and P dot over underscore the hill question mark is going to give me true or false. And if we look back, that's exactly what we get. Lastly, let's look at class person class variables dot RB. Same setup, we've defined a class person. Add our accessor for f name, l name, and age. So any object of class person has defined for it a first name, last name, and age. Notice now that I've got this at at hair colors. We have to differentiate right now, and it's useful to think about this because it'll come up more in Rails as we get going. The difference between an instance variable and a class variable. Let's just agree for now at least that these five represent the possible hair colors for a person. Now, the possible set of hair colors, which may be useful in my application, isn't tied to just one person. It's not that Brian as a person or the variable name P should represent the hair colors. That belongs more to the class than to an instance. The first name, last name, and age are specific to each instance of the class, each object of that class type. But hair colors is something different. I want to associate it with the class as a whole, but not with any instance of the class. So in line six, I define this what's called class variable, at at hair colors, in this case is an array, more on that to come, but it'll work now in this simple example for us. And then on line eight, I define a class method. Notice on line eight, it's defined self dot hair colors. So there is both a class variable named hair colors, which is an array with five elements, black, brown, blonde, purple, red. And there's also, so that I can get to it, so that I can spit it out when I need to, a method called hair colors, which is a class method. So look what happens. On line 29 and 30, we create a new instance and print it to the screen. We've seen that before. But on line 32 now, notice I'm printing to the screen not p.haircolors, but rather person.haircolors, person being the name of the class. Again, hair colors are associated with the class as a whole. P is an instance of the class. It has first names, last names, and ages. So here you can see the first puts statement gives me Brian Hoke comma age 44. The second one gives me those, in this case, enumerated array types. So a little more about classes and objects, specifically adder accessor, which we'll use pretty extensively.